Did God really curse a whole nation of people because Noah's son saw him without his clothing? Did a rooster actually crow after Peter denied Jesus? What does Jesus mean when he talks about good eyes and evil eyes? Every language has words or phrases called idioms. These are words or phrases that mean something beyond the literal definitions of those words themselves. We have idioms in English, like under the weather, or hit the sack, go steady, or be an eager beaver. Our language is filled with dozens of idioms like these. They make no sense or they mean something quite different when they're interpreted literally, but as a culture, we naturally understand them. Well, the same thing was true for the Hebrew people. They used a variety of idioms. We actually see them throughout the Old Testament, and many of them were translated literally into Greek by the authors of the New Testament. But here's the problem. Rather than translating the meanings of these idioms, most of our Bibles just give us the literal translations. And because of this, we miss what the Bible is really saying. So today, we're going to change that. Today, I'm going to share with you seven Hebrew idioms that will change the way that you read the Bible in this episode of Misreading Scripture. In Proverbs, one English translation says, The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Later it says, The stingy are eager to get rich, and are unaware that poverty awaits them. But that's not actually what these verses say. The Hebrew says something quite different. The phrase translated generous is the Hebrew phrase ayin tova. It literally means good eye. Similarly, the phrase translated stingy is ayin ra'a. It literally means bad eye. These were common idioms in Hebrew culture, and our modern translations tell us what they really mean. They translate the idiom. And yet, what's interesting is that while biblical translations preserved these particular idioms and proverbs, they did not do so in one of Jesus' teachings. At one point, Jesus says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, if you're like me, you might have interpreted this passage to mean that we must look kindly upon people, or we must not lust, or we must be careful about what we look at and how we interpret those things. But that isn't really the point of Jesus' passage, right? That's not the point that Jesus is trying to make here, because Jesus is using idioms. You see, Jesus is making the statement in the midst of a teaching about storing up treasures in heaven, right after he has just said, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So ultimately, Jesus isn't talking about lust or insight. He's talking about greed and generosity. Jesus is using the phrases ayin tova and ayin ra'a. He's saying that if you have good eyes, if you are generous, then your whole body will be filled with light. But if you have bad eyes, if you're greedy, then your whole life will be filled with darkness. And when we realize that, we realize that Jesus' true lesson is about how we love others, how we live out the greatest commandment. He's showing us that true blessing comes not in how much we can store up for ourselves. It comes in how much we can give for others. In Mark 7, the chapter begins with Jesus debating the Pharisees over the tradition of ritual hand-washing. However, immediately following this, Jesus shifts the conversation toward the subject of the sixth commandment. Jesus says, Moses said, honor your father and mother. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. Now in general, Jesus is trying to point out that the Pharisees ignore or disobey the written Torah by strictly adhering to the oral traditions. And this isn't really a new criticism. Many religious leaders at that time considered the oral tradition as binding, if not actually more binding than the written Torah. But notice what Jesus is saying in this last verse. He accuses the Pharisees of nullifying the Torah, 
Other translations say that they cancel or void the word of God. But is that really the case? If the Pharisees pass down this tradition, it nullifies the entire Torah? I mean, that seems extreme. Well, that's because when Jesus says this, he's using two Hebrew idioms, abolish and fulfill. Jesus also uses these idioms when he says that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. To abolish the law was an idiom that meant to interpret it incorrectly. So to fulfill the law meant that the person had properly interpreted it. Well, this sheds an entirely new light on the charge that Jesus is leveling against the Pharisees in this moment. He's not saying that their tradition destroys the law altogether. He's telling them that their tradition is leading them to interpret and practice the law incorrectly. Right? This tradition of dedicating things to God is actually prohibiting them from honoring their father and their mother. And in the end, they're just not truly understanding what scripture is telling them to do. Have you ever heard Christians use the phrase, the name of Jesus? Right, like somebody will be praying and they will end the prayer by saying, in Jesus' name. Or they'll say that our prayers are only heard if they are prayed in Jesus' name. What does all that mean? Well, one thing that we should know is that the name of Jesus isn't a magic word, right? That's not what this term means. It's not like abracadabra, you just say the name Jesus and all of a sudden everything you want comes true. You see, the Hebrew word for name is shame. But shame refers to more than just the word you use to address somebody. Shame refers to a person's identity, their authority. To bear a person's name means that you are that person's representative. I mean, think about it this way, right? It's like when a police officer says, stop in the name of the law. Now, the word law doesn't have any real significance in and of itself, right? What those police are saying is stop because we represent the law. We bear the authority of the law. We bear its name. Well, Jesus says the same sort of thing to his disciples. Jesus says, no one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil of me. He also says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. In each of these verses, the phrase, my name, refers to those who represent him. When his disciples perform miracles, they do it by his authority. They do it in his name. When someone welcomes a child, he's letting them know that when they see this child, they see him. When we understand it this way, all of a sudden, we have a new perspective on the third commandment. When God says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, God isn't talking about using God's name as part of a curse word or just saying God's name flippantly. There's more going on here. God is talking about how we represent God in this world. We are God's name. We are the image of God. We are God's representatives. When people see us, they're supposed to see a reflection of who God is, what God desires. We are the ones that God has commissioned to invite others into a relationship with God. We've been given the authority to usher in God's kingdom here on earth because we do it all in the name of Jesus. There was a popular phrase at the time of Jesus that we see in Matthew's gospel. Jesus tells Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The words for binding and loosing are the Hebrew words asar and hitir. These were idioms often used in reference to religious requirements. For instance, while the Torah required that people observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, it didn't specifically outline how they were supposed to do this. And because of this, traditions arose around what was permitted on the Sabbath and what wasn't. If something was forbidden, it was asar, it was bound. But if something was permitted, it was hitir, it was loosed. So when Jesus tells Peter that he's giving him the keys to the kingdom and that whatever he binds on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever he looses on earth will be loosed in heaven, we now have a better sense of what he's saying. Jesus is telling Peter that he now has the ability to determine what is prohibited and what is permitted for future generations. Once Jesus is gone, 
and especially as the gospel spreads into Gentile regions, people will wonder what is bound and what is loosed, what is forbidden and what isn't. And Peter will be the one to determine that. Now, before we dive into our next word, please take a moment to go down below and click the thumbs up and the subscribe buttons if you're liking this video. If this is your first time joining us, then welcome. And if you're joining us again, then welcome back. You are the reason that we do this. Our goal is to help people understand scripture more easily and see it with an entirely new set of eyes. And by clicking those like and subscribe buttons, you help us to realize that vision by reaching even more people. So thank you so much for your support. And now, on to our next word. As we mentioned a moment ago, in the third commandment, God tells the Israelite people, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And at the time of Jesus, there was a significant portion of the population who took this phrase quite literally. They believed that people shouldn't even speak God's name. The Hebrew letters that form this personal name for God are Yod, He, Vav, and He. And since ancient Hebrew did not include vowels, there was debate about how to pronounce this word. Some say Yahweh, others say Jehovah. But at the time of Jesus, many people so greatly revered God's name that they would actually replace it with other words, right? And one of the words that they would often use was heaven. For instance, just after Jesus tells the parable of the seeds and the sower, his disciples ask why he speaks in parables. And when Matthew recounts Jesus' response, he says, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. But Mark records it differently. In Mark, Jesus says, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. They're saying the same thing, but they're using different words. Matthew says kingdom of heaven. Mark says kingdom of God. In other places, you'll see Jesus use the phrase the reign of God. All of these phrases are talking about the same thing. They're talking about the moment when God reigns on earth, when Rome is no longer in power, but God is in charge. Creation is restored. Things are as God originally intended them to be. This is the day that people have been longing for for centuries, and both Matthew and Mark tell us about it. The only difference is, Mark is comfortable using God's name, and Matthew isn't. If you've heard the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, then you're probably familiar with Peter's experience that night. At the Last Supper, Jesus says that one of the disciples will betray him, and Peter proclaims that he will die for Jesus. But Jesus disputes him. He says that before the cock crows, Peter will deny him three times. And as Jesus is being accused before the Sanhedrin, that's exactly what happens. Three times, people address Peter, proclaiming that he is a disciple of Jesus. And three times, Peter denies it. And right as Peter denies it for the last time, the cock crows. Now, if you're anything like me, You've probably imagined that a rooster was standing somewhere around this courtyard and began to give this morning call as these events unfolded. In fact, some translations actually say that a rooster crowed. But that's not necessarily what happened. You see, the phrase translated cock crow would be the Hebrew phrase kerot hagaver. It literally means the call of the cock. But in Hebrew, Gever is also the word for man. And this explains the idiom that formed around this phrase. You see, at the time of Jesus, the night was divided into multiple shifts. And during one of those shifts, sometime between midnight and 3 a.m., a karoth hagaver, a cock crier, would blow a horn signaling the changing of the temple guard. We actually see something similar recorded in the Mishnah. In Sukkah 5.4, it tells us that at cock crow, they blew a sustained, a quavering, and another sustained blast. This actually gives us quite a different picture of what happened when Peter betrayed Jesus. Jesus was telling Peter that he would hear a familiar sound, a sound that everyone knew was coming. 
It was a sound that would occur in the middle of the night, not at the break of dawn. And it wasn't going to be the sound of an animal welcoming a new day. It would be the sound of horns, the changing of the guard, a sound that would show him that this final opportunity to remain faithful to Jesus was now officially over. There's a moment in scripture that always confused me. After the floods have subsided, Noah and his family disembark from the ark. And not long after that, something terrible happens. Genesis says, Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. Now for me, this always seemed like a confusing reaction. It sounded like an accident, like Ham walked in and saw something that he wasn't supposed to. But it didn't seem malicious. Was it really prohibited to see another man naked, even if it was your father? Is Ham in trouble because he told his brothers and maybe he shamed Noah that way? And was something so bad that it would actually merit cursing an entire nation of people? Well, the reason this is so confusing is because there's actually another meaning to this phrase. You see, the phrase, see your father's nakedness, is an idiom that can mean to sleep with your father or even with your father's wife. It goes way beyond walking into the room and catching someone undressing. The author of Genesis is telling us that Ham took advantage of either Noah or Noah's wife. It was shameful and forbidden. In fact, it was exactly the kind of behavior that God just flooded the world to prevent. This is why Ham's descendants, the Canaanites, are cursed. Ham's behavior threatened to undo everything that God had just done. It was more than an accident. It was an awful act of abuse. And now that we understand what that idiom means, we understand why the response is so severe. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Now that you know these seven phrases, go back and look at these passages and see how it changes your understanding of these scriptures. Also, if you found this interesting and you'd like to learn more, sign up for my newsletter. Every month, I have a section in my newsletter where I highlight words like these that will change the way that you read scripture. You'll actually find a subscription link in the description below. And finally, go ahead right now and click this link right here that will take you to another video in our Miss Reading Scripture series. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, have a great week, and God bless.